Good morning. It's wonderful to see all of you here. Thank you to all of you that are joining us from afar. We are united in Christ no matter where we're at. He is not confined by anything that's happening to us. And so he is wherever we are, worshiping him together. So would you stand with us as we sing this morning of our gratefulness to our great God. you have
middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. to fight for me, so I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm.
Oh, oh. 
has done for us. Um, I pray that we would remember what he's still doing as well, that it didn't end there. He saved us from our sin. He took it all. All. There's nothing he didn't take to the cross. Every little thing. And so I, I pray that we can release those things this morning that we might be holding on to. And remember that he is above all and in all and is working through all, all of the time. Even now, in the midst of us here, in the midst of the trials around us, he's not surprised, he's not unaware, and he is with us in all of it, in every storm. Let this bless you this morning as you bless him with your praise.
so be it. Good morning. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning, another beautiful morning. I'm Jim Jensen, one of the elders here in Footville, and I appreciate you being with us if you're live and in person or wherever you are watching. Um, it is the end of August. Can you believe that? Um, we're kind of out of our routine, but uh, remember when we used to take a benevolence offering on the fifth Sunday of the month? Some of you may recall that. Um, we're, kinda, we're kind of out of the practice of doing that on the fifth Sunday, but I don't want us to get totally out of the practice of giving to the Benevolence Fund. Um, we've had, I've noticed the last couple of months, more needs than we've had um, offerings. So um, there's a lot of need out there and we're meeting those needs and we appreciate your, your um, giving. And I can tell you that um, we've been blessed during this long period of whatever it is we're in. Um, I, I'm so grateful for the way God has provided for the church and um, blessed us through the faithfulness of his givers. Uh, we are, we've been able to meet all of our um, missions needs at 100 percent plus uh, we've been able to uh, meet our needs in our general fund budget we are at or above budget in giving which is phenomenal and uh, so uh, it's a praise but remember our benevolence you don't have to give today um, if you want to give any time we have several ways that you can give now during this period. If you're in person with us, we've got a collection um, container in the foyer that you can drop your offering in. Uh, if, you're, if you'd prefer to mail it in, drop it off at the church, um, you can do that. We also have the option of giving online. And... Uh, Quite a few people are using that. They find it convenient. Um, and you can find a link to that. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, you can find a link on Facebook for that. Um, you can also set up recurring giving on that um, site very easily, which some people have done, and um, it's very, very convenient. So if you have questions about that, you can see me or John or uh, any of us message us, whatever, and we'll be glad to help you out with that. Um, something we're not out of the routine of is is taking uh, part in the communion service together as a church. Uh, it's what unites us. Um, so whether you're whether you're here in person or wherever you are, we want to we want to take that time this morning to remember the sacrificial love of Jesus. And uh, if you're here in person, I'll remind you again that um, you should have picked up one of those little self-contained uh, cups with the juice and the bread. If you didn't, you can run out and get one. We aren't distributing those to avoid uh, unnecessary contact, I guess. And if you're at home, use whatever emblems you have available. We We'd like you to participate with us. How do you know that you're a Christian? Or how do people know that you are a Christian? You ever think about that? Maybe you wear a cross or you've got a tattoo or um, maybe... Um, People know that you come to church every Sunday, that that's important to you. Um, maybe you. Maybe it's by the things you don't do. Maybe it's because, well, I don't swear a lot when I'm at work like other people do, or I don't 
frequent places that a lot of people do. I don't go to those places. People see that and they know you're, you're different somehow. Um, but I don't know if you ever really thought about that, how people s know that you are a Christian. Um, what, is, what does Jesus say about that? And I went back to what John asked us to do, um, look, at, encourage, look for encouraging verses in the book of John, and I picked one out that, I guess this is encouraging, but after I got into it, it's encouraging because it's, uh, it's simple, but it's also very um, challenging and demanding. And some people never, never quite get there with it. Um, but it's John 13:35. Jesus says that by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. He preceded that with um, a new command I give you, love one another. As I, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. This was a, and I love this passage or this section of scripture and John's been through this recently. Um, John 13 through 16, where it's, it's the day, the night before um, Jesus is crucified and he's meeting with his disciples and um, he washes their feet and um, Judas betrays him. Um, and if you recall, John was seated or reclined next to Jesus and they had a little intimate conversation about, you know, John asked, who is this? Who, which one of us? And Jesus told him, well, the, the, this one, it will be this one. And so John got a little extra um, dialogue with Jesus. And, and you can tell that John was um, profoundly affected by this interaction with Jesus, as were all the disciples. This was a, this was a really a, um, a key moment for their development as disciples when Jesus talked about um, his love. John um, wrote the epistle or the letter of 1 John, and that's really a commentary about these verses in here that Jesus talks about. If you read all through 1 John, you'll read about the love of Jesus, the love of God, and how it is to flow through us. And so I want to read a couple of short passages from 1 John. From 1 John 2, starting with verse 3. We know that we have come to know him, Jesus, if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And then in 1 John 4, starting with verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, 
and his love is made complete in us. And again, the words of Jesus, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. I think Jesus is telling us that in everything we do, we need to have a love first attitude. There's lots to not like in our world right now. Um, Lots of wrongs we'd like to right. We want to prove we're right. We want to defend our rights. Um, But in our attempts to right all the wrongs, are we bringing people closer to Jesus or driving them further away? Jesus died for you and for me, the worst of sinners, and he did it out of love. Love first. It starts with you and me. Um, People need to see and feel love in our lives and in the church. The world desperately needs the love of Jesus. By this, the world will know if we love one another. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your sacrifice, for your unconditional, unending love for us. And we remember that love this morning as you asked us to do. But Lord, we, we want it to be more than remembering. We want it to, we want it to change us. As we sang about this morning, we, we pray that your Holy Spirit would, would, uh, would change us. Um, your word says that um, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit gives us that, that uh, unending source of love that we can show to others. Lord, we know there's no, no easy fix to the problems that we see around us in our divided country, in our world. But the answer is simple. We need the love of Jesus first. Help us to live with that love first attitude. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. If you have your bulletin, if you take out your prayer list, I have one addition to uh, make to it. Uh, this Friday, Tom Natz is going to have some surgery on his neck. Um, he has already had some surgery on his neck, and there are some uh, issues that he's had ongoing since last, I think, a year ago, January, if I'm right on that. Uh, they've identified an issue in his mid-back, but they can't deal with that. Uh, until they do at least one or maybe two neck surgeries. And so this uh, Friday is going to be the first of at least two or three surgeries on his neck and back. So if you'd be praying for Tom and Terry, I know they would appreciate that very much. Um, one announcement to make, uh, if you're trying to watch Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, this past Saturday, there were technical issues. That's gonna be Tuesday night. Um, so if you have liked the church's Facebook page, uh, on my phone, I always get a notification when the church goes live for something, and so it'll just kind of pop up. And so um, be watching for that. I think 6.30 is the time for that. Um, so uh, please uh, watch that. There's a great time just to worship God through those videos and just be refreshed uh, through uh, what we can watch there. Let's pray, and then we'll look at our text today. God, we thank you for this day and for... Uh, your blessing in our lives and for your uh, constant compassion and grace uh, in uh, everything that we do. And God, I ask that you just be with uh, Tom and Terry, uh, be with Tom as they go through this surgery and, and uh, just help him as uh, he goes through recovery again. And uh, be with Terry as she cares for him at home. And, and Lord, we know that you, uh, you know everything that's going on. We ask you to just guide and direct the doctor's hands and work through them to bring healing to his body. God, we also thank you for this text uh, that we have today and for uh, your words and your truth that you give us uh, in it. And so, Lord, we just ask that your spirit would reveal truth to us, that your spirit would just speak to our hearts and our minds, and your spirit would speak through me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, as we start our time today. Uh, again, just one more accountability thing. You should have, if you're doing your homework, reading through John's Gospels, you should have read through uh, John's Gospel by, you know, either today or tomorrow, finishing it up. Uh, chapters 15 through 21 were mine this week. I'll share with you my verse at the end of the sermon because it's appropriate there. Uh, but uh, you were supposed to look for verses that encourage you. And so if you haven't done that yet, I'd encourage you to finish that up in the next couple of days. Uh, as we go through September, we're going to be in John through September as I've looked at all the texts and kind of broken it out and planned the rest of the series. Um, as we go through September, because of the text that we're into now and the story that's being talked about, uh, next week is the crucifixion. I would encourage you as you read through John's gospel, look for verses that talk about God's salvation, eternal life that he provides for us, and just look at all the times things like that show up in John's gospel. And my guess is you might already know one. You might already have it memorized. And here's, here's the example. John 3.16 you know it? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's the kind of verse that we need to be looking at and, and just paying attention to those. Those verses show up a lot in John's gospel. And then as you're doing that, again, be praying for the opportunity to share that, what you find about eternal life, about salvation, uh, about what he does for us, Ask for an opportunity to share that with someone. Because it's good for us to learn these things and remember these things and think about these things, but it really doesn't do anyone else any good unless we share it. And so we need to be asking God to give us those opportunities. As we get in today's text, I have a confession to make, and I believe that there's something uh, that's true that probably we all agree on. But I'm not sure that any one of us would really say it, because when I say this in a minute, it's probably going to feel a little bit petty and complaining. Uh, but I got an email about this, and it said exactly what I'm going to say, so I know since I got an email, it must be true. 
and that's this. The communion. The bread here tastes like styrofoam. Now, I haven't done any control settings to, you know, choose styrofoam to see if it's very similar to that, but, you know, as I eat it, it's not, it gets stuck in my teeth and I have to chew on it for a while. I don't know if you feel that way. Maybe it's just me. And some of these, sometimes I get, uh, and I open it up and I drink the juice, and it's really sour and bitter. Have you noticed that too? On occasion it shows up. And, and, and like I said, it, I know it's, it's petty that I'm complaining about it, but, you know, and at, at first with the juice, I thought, well, if, maybe if we put them in the refrigerator, that will help it because the first box we used had just been sitting out. And, well, we put that box in the refrigerator and it didn't change anything. So I just think it's the way the bread's made and the juice is produced, I don't know what it is. And, and I, I, I don't know if you've noticed that or felt that way. Um, in fact, I have to confess that on occasion, sometimes this top seal on this uh, packet comes loose and the bread falls out. And when I find one of those, I put it in a Ziploc bag and then I get a piece of the good communion bread and I throw that in there. And that's what I use on Sunday morning. You know, so maybe you guys are going to go look for some of those and see if you can find them. But I think it will, Matt. You know, I, well, I don't know this will, but Jesus will definitely get us to heaven. But, yeah, and those of you who have thought that, do you ever feel guilty about thinking that? That, oh, this tastes terrible? I mean, I have. I'll just be honest. I have felt guilty. And I guess the reason that I feel guilty is because the text we're starting to move through is that it seems petty to complain about something like that or to just even think about it. Well, today's text makes it rather evident that I shouldn't complain about it you know, about what tastes like styrofoam and, and fermented juice, but in fact, I think, and I'll share this with you at the end, I think they can actually help us understand this text better. So we'll be in John 18 and 19. We're going to look at Jesus' trial before Pilate. Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea, and so let's look at the text, and the first verse we're going to start with is chapter 18, verse 32. We looked at this verse a couple weeks ago, but I want to look at it one more time where we see that Jesus knew God's plan. Now, we've talked about this before, that in the text we see multiple times that Jesus knows exactly what's going to take place. He knows the death that he's going to die. He knows everything that they're going to do to him. Uh, in the first part of the chapter, it says that, in chapter 18. And verse 32 reinforces that truth. Here it is. It says, This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. So everything, everything that was going to happen, he knew. And Paul puts it this way in Philippians 2.8, that Jesus was obedient to death, even death on a cross. In that verse, Paul kind of puts a little exclamation point in there that he didn't just die, he died on a cross. And to Paul's readers who knew about crucifixion and probably seen it and all the suffering that goes along with it, I think they were like, oh, he didn't just die. He went through that. And Jesus had probably seen people who were crucified in his life. Typically, the Romans, because they used crucifixion to punish criminals and remind the people that they're in control, it was as much of a psychological weapon on their part, as it was a form of execution, they would always put crosses on main roads going into town so that if you were going to town that day and there was a crucifixion, there's no way you could walk around it. You would have to see it because it would, it would be as close to me as that first pew if I was walking down the road. They wanted people to know we're in charge and if you don't follow what we say, this is what we're going to do to you. And Jesus knew everything that was going to happen to him. Well, in this trial, the first thing that we see happen in this trial before Pilate is that the truth was rejected. If we go to court, if we're called as a witness, or if we're a defendant and witnesses are called to testify, we expect them to tell the truth, don't we? In fact, if you're in court and you sit there and you take an oath, I've done that before, I've had to testify in court where I've 
raised my right hand and sworn that I would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. I've done that. We expect that. But in Jesus' trial, the truth was heard about him, and the truth was rejected. And Pilate knows something is up when the Jewish leaders come to him, and they say, hey, this guy just deserves to die. But even when he finds out the truth, it doesn't stop Jesus from dying. Look at the text, verses 33 through the first part of 38. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Retorted Pilate. The truth will come out as we will see as we work our way down through the text, but Pilate seems skeptical or at least felt that the truth was subjective the truth could change depending on the situation jesus tells him the truth about who he is in fact all through john's gospel he's been talking about him telling and testifying about truth it's interesting the word truth shows up in the new international version of the bible 127 times most of those are in the new testament 22 of those are in John's Gospel, and 20 of those are either statements Jesus made or that John made about Jesus. And so when John writes his Gospel, he's trying to get people to understand that there's this struggle with understanding what truth is. Pilate verbalizes it here. What is truth? And John will say over and over again, as Jesus testifies about it, as he writes about it, that this is truth, that Jesus is the Son of God, Lord, Savior, Messiah. And just like Pilate, people will hear it. People might hear us talk about it. We might share a verse that we read with them. But time and time again, people reject the truth that's found in the story of Jesus. Something else that happens in this trial is that Barabbas was freed. Jesus came to die and provide salvation for all of us, to offer eternal life to all who believe, and to die in our place. But for Barabbas, he did it twice. Look at the text, verse 38. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Could you imagine what it would have been like to be Barabbas, to be facing certain death, only to have Jesus die in your place? I've always wondered about Barabbas. I've always wondered what happens to him. We really don't know anything else except about right here what takes place. But I've always wondered, did that change him? Did he go and watch the man that died in his place? Or did he just escape off into the shadows to get away from the Romans in case they might arrest him again and take him back and throw him back into prison? I don't know. I've always wondered, did he ever hear the gospel message preached by John or the other apostles or by Peter? Was he there on the day of Pentecost? Was he one of those who were baptized that are among those nameless thousands? I just don't know. But I wonder if it changed him that Jesus, this rabbi, this innocent man, died in his place. Another thing we see in the text is that Jesus was mocked. Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords, but to Pilate and the Roman soldiers, he's just one more Jew that doesn't deserve anything from them, that doesn't even deserve to be treated like a human being, let alone as God. Verses 1 through 3 of chapter 19 say this, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns 
and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Pilate orders Jesus to be flogged. Prisoners routinely died just from that. In fact, by itself, flogging was such a brutal form of punishment, and because of the laws that were in place, the Roman soldiers would not give 40 lashes. That's usually what they gave. They would only give 39. Because the law was, if you were giving this to a prisoner, and you gave one lash too many, then you would have to go through it. So they always stopped short because they didn't want to have miscounted and them have to go through the very same thing. They understood what would happen to them if they made that mistake. Because in the flogging, the the whip had pieces of bone and metal tied to it and it wouldn't just lash across their back, it would dig in and they would yank it back and just rip the skin loose. And they did it over and over and over again. And they didn't just go after the back. They worked the prisoner head to toe. And so for someone who's crucified, who's cro- the cross would be up against their back. And they have to push up and down just to breathe. Can you imagine the pain just from the flogging? And the blood loss that comes from it as well. And they had insult to injury. They mock him. Who are you? Are you some king? We can slap you around. You're no God. You're no king. You're nothing to us. They were experts at inflicting physical harm, and they were obviously willing to inflict it any way that they could. We can also see in the text that the Jewish leaders rejected Jesus' claims. This isn't new. They've done it many times before, but it's clear from what happens next that they clearly understood who Jesus claimed to be. Look at verses 4 through 7. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. They don't believe that Jesus is God's Son. If they had, they would have acted differently. But it's clear they understand what Jesus had said about himself, and they have rejected it. Even with all the miracles, even with all the amazing things he had done, raising people from the dead, healing the blind, causing the lame to walk, even as he taught them about God, and they couldn't thwart him, his wisdom was far above their own. They could see all kinds of things that helped them see that he was a man of God. None of it has convinced them, because they hate him, and they want him dead. But they didn't kill Jesus because in the text we see that Jesus laid down his life. All of this was Jesus' choice. He chose to die as a sacrifice. And Jesus makes it clear to Pilate, who now looks at him much differently, that he was choosing to go to the cross. Verses 8 through 11. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed over me to to you is guilty of a greater sin. Jesus yields himself to God's will. No one has power over him. God is letting Pilate participate in his plan to redeem humanity. And Pilate is afraid. I would be too. He wants to let Jesus go, but he just won't do it. Because, last of all, he gives in to their demands. 
He has said multiple times that he hasn't found any evidence to support Jesus' execution. But remember, truth isn't carrying any weight in this trial. This trial is governed by mob rule, and Pilate is now just looking for a way out. Verses 12 through 15. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate said? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. The Jewish leaders knew what to say to convince Pilate to do what they wanted. Pilate wanted to let him go. He wanted to set him free, but when they started making accusations that Pilate wasn't loyal to Caesar, and Pilate knew if that got back to Caesar, that he would probably be in trouble. He tries to let Jesus go, but their response is rather amazing. They chose Caesar over the king of kings. So how does our styrofoam communion bread and sour grape juice help us understand this text better? I think it can remind us of the bitterness that Jesus went through, of the floggings, the mockings, the rejection of who he is. He went through all of that for us. I think it can remind us of how it isn't the bread and it isn't the juice that will satisfy us, but it is only knowing the one who has saved us from death and allows us to taste and see that the Lord is good, that he alone satisfies. I think it can remind us that Jesus claims to be our Lord and Savior, that his death, which provided eternal life, that the eternal blessings that we will experience, that they can be remembered and celebrated by such ordinary things, even things that don't taste good to us. They, they can be God's tools, no matter how we like them or not, for us to help uh, learn how to worship him. It can help us remember that even though these don't taste good, not as good as what they replaced, and that we probably might long for what we had before, we can be thankful that Jesus took our place, that he did that for Barabbas, and he does it for us as well, that one day we will feast in heaven, eating at the table he prepares for us, and on that day we will experience things that will cause us to forget our styrofoam wafers and sour juice. It can remind us that if we use these to remember Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, that God can take our lives no matter how broken, bland, sour, or flawed, and he can transform us by the glorious work and power of the Holy Spirit to become who God sees because of the blood of Christ that makes us whiter than snow and perfect in his eyes, it can help us remember that as we pick them up in the foyer and we know exactly how they're going to taste and what they're going to be like as we come together and we celebrate communion and remember all that Jesus has done for us, that texture we will experience, that flavor that we will taste, that we can remember that when Jesus did all this for us, he knew exactly everything they were about to do to him. And he willingly laid down his life for us and for everyone else who would believe in him. I guess maybe having styrofoam bread and sour juice is a good thing for us. I think they can really help us remember well what Jesus has done for us. As we come to our time of invitation, I want to share with you what verses I found this week. And we'll look at them. They're at John 20. They're going to be here on the screen. Here they are. It says, Jesus performed 
many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book, but these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Do you know God? God who became a man, to come to earth to know exactly what would happen to him in his life, to become our sacrifice, to die in our place, to be the one who gives us eternal life and salvation. If you don't know him, I'd love to talk with you about him, but for the rest of us, we have great reminders each week that can remind us well of the time that we remember Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and we can worship him using these very simple emblems, things that are just ordinary, things that may not be exactly what we like, but things that help us know and understand what Jesus did for us on the cross. So today, if you have a public decision you'd like to make, please come forward as we stand and sing.
Let's pray. Jesus, we are so thankful that you provided salvation for us. And we're so amazed that you knew everything that was going to happen to you and you did it for us. That sometimes when we complain or we're ungrateful or our lives are lived in opposition to you or we sin, that you still love us. You still model that love for us and want us to become like you. So that, like Jim said, that other people will know that we are your disciples because we love each other. Lord, help us to love each other well and help us to love the people around us even more. Because there are people that need to hear that you died for them, that you gave your life for them and that their eternity can be changed if they'll just simply accept the grace that you offer. So Lord, as we go from this place, give us opportunities to share our faith. Give us opportunities to talk about what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a great week.